president-elect of the IEEE Technical Committee on Security and Privacy. And he has been, is currently editor of the Journal of Cryptology. He has served as a guest editor of IEEE Transactions on Software Engineering. And he has shared many IACAR, ICAR, um, and IEEE conferences and has served as uh, an author and editor of many international publications. And so without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Tom Burson to you. Thank you, Professor Irvin. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to dedicate my lecture today to the memory of my cousin, Henry Hecker, who died last night in New York City. Henry was a teacher. So there are people, some people, who believe that the world is held together by wires and by fibers and by radio links and by protocols and in general by the communications mesh that we make. And I'm one of those people. And there are also some people who believe that the world is held together by the stories that we tell to one another around the campfire or in email or on television or on the silver screen or in record communication. Um, and I'm also one of those people. There are also people who believe that those who are in the technological world, that is, the netheads, and those who are in the message world, the content heads, <coughs> have nothing to say to one another. In fact, they live in two separate worlds. Uh, I'm not one of those people. This uh, idea of the world was started I think notor most notoriously by the British philosopher C.P. Snow in a lecture he gave in 1952, talked about two worlds, the epistemological bifurcation. <coughs> this lecture today attempts to, attempts to um, stand with one leg in each of those worlds. We're going to talk about old stories and new technologies and see why the old stories uh, still can shed some light on new technologies. I'm going to, of course, make the uh, claim that they do, that they can. And the thesis of the talk is that this old Chinese military wisdom is still relevant in the information age. Why should that be? I mean, assume it is. Why, why should it be? Why might, why might it be? Certainly, technology has changed since the 5th century BCE. Technology has changed tremendously. But military strategy is not only about technology, in fact, it may not be primarily about technology, but is also about human nature. And human nature has changed only slowly since the fifth century BCE, if at all. And certainly the objectives of war have changed only slowly since the fifth century BCE. And that's why I think it's going to work that this old Chinese military wisdom will illuminate our actions in cyberspace. Now, is the Navy in cyberspace? Yes or no? Yes? Was that a, was that a yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, was that a yes? You know, we're all, uh, you read about this revolutionary, revolution in military affairs, how better processing, better communications grid, better sensor nets, um, precision guided weapons and so on are going to lead to a revolution in military affairs and the military is going to conduct itself with the same alacrity as Walmart and Morgan Grenfell, you know, who know at the close of every day exactly what was sold in what store and how much can they ship. I mean, there are many, many commercial studies, corporate studies of revolution in commercial affairs that have been brought about due to increased computation communications. And the uh, bet at the moment in the United States is that the same technological changes can lead to a revolution in military affairs. Um, this seems especially attractive in a time of shrinking budgets, because the idea is to do the same job, or actually bigger jobs, um, with less money uh, to do it. This is embodied at the JCS level in the Joint Vision 2010. Everybody read it? No. <laughs> read it. I mean, it's, not, it's sort of an executive summary, easy to read. Uh, 
Um, the, uh, the Navy has followed up with its architecture for the 21st century, IT21. Uh, they put real money behind it. As far as I can figure out, it's about $2.5 billion in IT21, IT21 related programs, programmed for um, fiscal 99 and out years at the moment. And I think that budget line is going to go up. Um, CNOJ Johnson has talked about the shift from platform centric warfare to network centric warfare. Uh, sort of the bet here is that what we used to call sea power, that is control of the sea lanes and the presence of the sea, uh, being able to project power from the sea, is going, uh, somehow, uh, net power is going to supplement, I don't want to say replace, is going to supplement sea power. I'm going to fight from the basis of the of the network. A great article about this, if you haven't seen it, was in the uh, Naval Institute proceedings last year, written by Admiral Art Zabrowski, uh, where he goes and uh, argues this uh, fairly articulately and without any equations. Um, certainly, most operators you speak to will begin to say now that cyberspace is a part of the battle space, and that cyberspace is something that has to be watched um, the same as uh, airspace, sea space, space space. So I think the answer there is yes, in case you didn't believe it going in. You may know something about the classics, some classics of Chinese uh, strategy. I think the whole tradition stems from Lao Tzu's book, Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching is sort of the introductory guide to the Tao. The Tao is the way, of course, the way and its power. It's a religious book. But it was followed shortly by a book that's come down to us as Sun Tzu's Bing Fa, Sun Tzu Art of War. And there's been a lot of commentary about Art of War since it was written. And there are whole schools of commentary on Art of War. There's the school called the 100 Marvelous, 100 Marvelous Battle Plan um, School. And then there's the 100 War Maxim School and the 36 Strategy School. Today we're going to follow the 36 Strategy School, only because 36 is a much smaller number than, <laughs> um, than 100. Although 36 and 100 are similar numbers in, in a certain way, which is what? Squares. Yes, they're both squares. Exactly. And um, that's not an, that's not the fact that they're both squares is not an accident to the Chinese. I mean, they it's 100 because it's 10 squared, and it's 36 because it's 6 squared, and 10 and 6 have different meanings in the sort of yin yang theory of, of what numbers um, mean. I mean, this is the foot in both worlds kind of stuff. Um, these are um, explicitly military texts. This is a religious text, explicitly military text, and then there's a whole bunch of writing following from this, which is in terms of stories and novels, although a Chinese novel is nothing like an American novel. I mean, the idea of modern romance novel isn't here. And there's this uh, Sangbo Yanyi, which is the Three Kingdoms, and then, <coughs> then later this uh, Tales from the Water Margin, which make um, great bedtime reading, because, because they're very episodic. And they tell about, um, especially Tales from the Water Margin, tell about skirmishes between bandits and good ban bandits, the good guys, and the authorities, the bad guys, and how the bandits outsmart the authorities, um, left, right, and center, usually using the authorities' um, strength and rigidity against them. We have nothing else to read. Read them. Has, have people here read um, Art of War as part of their curriculum? Not as part of anyhow? Great. Because I mean, there's a, I have about 20 of them in my in my collection. I think this is a very good translation. This is by Samuel Griffith. He was a Marine general. And for those who don't like words, there's a uh, uh, classic comics version. <laughs> <laughs> and the nice thing about this classic comics version is that the the words are exactly a translation. They haven't they haven't dumbed down the translation at all. What they've just done is illustrated it with comics to help make it um, help make it go down better. Uh, Sun Tzu Speaks, it's called. This is a basis of the 36 strategy thing. Uh, pick this up in Beijing. It's called The Wiles of War, 36 Military Strategies from Ancient China. Good. So you know about Sun Tzu. 
Do you know who Sun Tzu was? He was an old guy. I mean, a guy who lived a long time ago. I don't know how old he got to be. It, um, for a long time, it was thought that Sun Tzu, the general, Sun Tzu the marshal, was a mythical person, sort of um, the, the mythical generator of these strategies. But it seems to be somebody called Sun Tzu, also called Sun Wu. Tzu is not a name. It's a, sort of an honorific. It means scholar or master. Okay, So it's Sun Tzu, Master Sun. Um, was also called Wu, or Son of the Marshal, and he lived in the 5th century BCE. Supposedly totally mythical until a few years ago something was discovered. Then there was somebody clearly related to him, but not him, who lived a lot later, a lot later, like 300 years later, called Sun Bin, who was also a strategist. And what happened is the Chinese have this huge archaeological problem. They have a lot of sites and not enough archaeologists. And um, and in the 70s, they were into this tomb, Han Dynasty, Han Dynasty tomb, called Silver Swallow Mountain Tomb. And um, they unearthed some stuff there from the sen second century BC that were verses from Sun Tzu Ping Fa, Sun Tzu's Art of War, written on bamboo strips, which somehow had survived, which both gave the date and the place and the time and the name. So maybe these guys weren't totally material. Then, confusingly, there's this other Sun Tzu who we come across in our studies, um, who was also called Sun Wu, who was a mathematician. And this Sun Tzu lived in the 5th century CE, maybe 3rd and 5th century. It's clear that the general and the mathematician are not the same person. I mean, nobody's lived that long since the Old Testament, right? So it's, it's clear that they're different people, but yet sometimes, um, sometimes they're confused. So I want to spend a moment talking about the mathematician, what the mathematician did that's come down to us, and, and to make it clear in your mind that the mathematician is different than the general. So, Sun Tzu, the mathematician, is best known for Sun Tzu's theorem. Now, that's Sun Tzu's. The, the, Robert Pinsky is the poet laureate of the United States at the moment. He says everybody should have a poem by heart. Um, when he says by heart, we would say by memory. But he's a poet, so he's by, by heart. I think everybody should have a, a theorem or two by heart. This may not be this may not be the theorem you want by heart. But essentially, this Sun Tzu's theorem, which we read about in our textbooks as the Chinese renamed the theorem, because textbook writers think that maybe Sun Tzu is too difficult a to name for us to remember. Much the same way about you know I mean you know familiar with Polish notation or reverse Polish notation. Right? There was really a guy there, right? His name was Lukashowitz. And, and the reason we call it Polish notation is because um, the name got dumbed down and came to us as Americans, as, as, not as Lukashowitz notation, but rather as Polish notation. Lukash Anyhow, Sun Tzu's theorem is that if you have a set of pairwise co-prime integers, whoa, whoa, pairwise co-prime. Um, let's parse that out a little bit. What's a prime number? Right, number divisible only by itself and one. So what does co-prime mean? Two numbers are co-prime. Here's a hint. They're adjacent. Prime prime. They're relatively prime. Right, that means that those two don't have any divisor except um, except for one. The greatest, the greatest common divisor of those two numbers is one. So for instance, um, how about 13 and 7? That's cheating because they're both prime numbers and all prime numbers are pairwise co prime. 9 and 4. <laughs> Nine and four. Uh -huh. 9 and 4. 9 and 4. There you go. 9 and 4 are both composite numbers, but they're pairwise co prime. So, okay. So, Sun Tzu's theorem is that if you have a bunch of, of numbers that are pairwise co prime, and then for any integers which are remainders, modulo those. There is a unique integer x. Up to this limit, which is the multiple of all those. Let me explain that graphically, because this isn't very clear at all. So, and this is why people thought it was the general. Because they said, oh, it's for counting troops. I don't think it's very good for counting troops. But suppose you had a vast number of troops, and you wanted to count the troops down to the very last person. And um, but you didn't want to count very high. So the idea is you could get the troops to line up first by sevens and see 
So there'd be a, a, a row of sevens, another row of seven, another row of an infinite number of rows, of, of some finite number of rows of sevens, actually. And then somebody left over, or some people left over. You just have to remember how many people are left over. And then you say the troops fall out and fall in again by 11s. Right? So in, in ranks 11 wide. So the troops fall back in 11 wide. How many are left over there? This looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this number that we're looking for, which is the number of troops, call it x, right? So x mod 7 is 1. x mod 11 is 6. And then have the troops fall out again and have them fall back in again by 13s. And, um, and you have 5 left over. Sun Tzu's theorem says that that's enough information to know how many troops there are. Just the, just the people left over is enough information to know how many troops um, there are. And tells you how to calculate it as well, which I won't go into. But here we have this example, right? X mod 7 was 1, X mod 11 was 6, X mod 13 was 5. And the answer, modulo the product of these primes, which is 1,001. So it's unique. It's unique from, from 0 to 1,001. Right? The answer is 512. Why do we care? Well, it's interesting. We care because it's interesting. But we also care because prime numbers are used pretty heavily these days in, um, in public key cryptography. For what? For encryption. For the, for, for the RSA crypto system. Right? The RSA crypto system. uses a modulus n, which is a product of two primes, p and q. So p and q, because their primes are pairwise distinct, right? A pair, pairwise co-prime. And, um, and there's a lot of computation involved in the RSA uh, crypto system. You're forever computing some message to the d, where d is a private key, mod n. And that's a very expensive operation. But if you know the private key, you also know P and Q, which is smaller, much smaller numbers. And um, you can compute X to the DP mod P, X to the DQ mod Q, and combine answers using the Chinese domain theorem and this algorithm by a guy named Gardner. And spend about a quarter of the time in computation that you'd spend before and get the same answer. So all of a sudden, Chinese domain theorem, Sun Tzu's theorem, not used for counting troops. Um, is useful in cyberspace. By the way, can anybody see why we, why Sun Tzu's theorem would be not really useful for counting troops? Takes too long. Takes too long. Yeah. Doesn't count for Yeah. <laughs> right. It's also pretty um, pretty ragged in dealing with errors. I mean, if you're off by one in the modulus, you're off by a long way in the answer. So if, so if some rank, instead of having seven people, has eight, um, your answer will be far from the correct answer. It's a very bad way to approximate. Um, so I don't think it's very useful to counting uh, troops. Let's move on to the meat of this stuff. Sun Tzu, the strategist. So Sun Tzu said that Against a skilled defender, there is no attack. Against a skilled, skilled attacker, there is no defense. <laughs> sounds pretty good. Oh, <coughs> sound. Sounds, sounds really good. I mean, it's sort of one of these yin yang kind of things. I mean, it's just total, it's total, it's total it's like the, It's like you know, the, the irresistible force meeting the, uh, the unmovable, unmovable body. Right? And in fact, um, this has to, a lot to do with formlessness, which is Taoist idea of formlessness and paradox. There's a lot of paradox in the Tao. Um, and the Tao talks about something called Wu Wei. Wu Wei is actionless action. It talks about the sage who does nothing and let, yet leaves nothing undone. It talks about the Ankar block. Um, it's, it's formless, and that's where Sun Tzu was coming from. But he was also an uh, experienced, apparently an experienced general, who was an expert in maneuver warfare and also psychological warfare. What are some of the things that Sun Tzu said? He said, those skills
killed in war subdue the enemy's army without battle. They capture his cities without assaulting them. They overthrow his state without protracted operations. Sounds a lot like dominance to me. We, of course, are increasingly dependent upon fragile information infrastructures for the conduct of our civil, personal civil and military affairs. There's recently been a study by something called the President's Commission on Critical Infrastructure Protection. This report you can read. Um, and they identified the following critical infrastructures in the United States. Telecommunications, power grid, aviation, finance, land transport, sea transport, and water supply. I was thinking, what are the critical infrastructures in addition to these what, what are the critical infrastructures that I've seen in my study of C4I systems? Well, C4I systems are pretty critical um, infrastructures, so I suggest to you, just to choose two examples, and not quite so random, um, that the zipper net is a piece of critical infrastructure that is tremendously fragile. And so is the GPS system, a piece of critical infrastructure that is fragile. So these are fragile infrastructures. If they're captured, or destroyed, or subverted, or modified in subtle ways that we don't notice, then we are subdued or destroyed or overthrown without the enemy having to battle. So Sun Tzu said, destroy the enemy's army without a battle. Destroy the enemy's fragile, critical infrastructures. And then you will have to destroy the enemy without a battle. Why battle against a strong point? Battle against a weak point seems to Sun Tzu also. Sun Tzu said, when the trees are seen to move, the enemy is advancing. Reminds you of something out of Macbeth, doesn't it? <laughs> when Burnham Wood comes to Dunsandane, that's the end of Macbeth. Well, that's because the guys are sneaking up behind the trees as they cut down. And that's, I think, what Sun Tzu was talking about, too. There is doubt in some quarters about whether or not um, whether or not there's doubt in some quarters about whether or not um, systems are under attack. There was recently a national intelligence estimate on information warfare. I can't really say here what it said, but it expressed skepticism <coughs> that systems are under attack. There's been a long history of threat documents expressing skepticism because there's no smoking gun or not a sufficient smoking gun to say, yeah, you can see the system went down, but we can't find anybody who did it. So with stuff, you know, we, we see stuff like trees fall in Oregon um, two summers ago and California had a blackout. I mean, was that an attack or was that, you know, a total weirdo accident? The air traffic control computers go down in Chicago for a second time few months ago. Is it an attack or not? Nobody knows. In fact, in a lot of places, you can't tell the difference between a good attack and, um, and an accident of the universe. Maybe the mark of a good attack in this sphere is that you can't tell it. The, the, the receiver of the, of the attack cannot distinguish it from an accident. There was a RAND study, this RAND game going around. I don't know if you played it here. I think it's called The Morning After. Where um, a series of things happen. Um, with the telephone switches and the air traffic control and the power grid. And the players of the game are supposed to make policy recommendations to the president about how to respond um, to these things. The answer, the answer is they couldn't decide whether they were under attack or whether there was just a series of freak and unfortunate accidents um, uh, going on. But yet, the newspapers and audit logs are full of warnings to those who have eyes to see that systems are periodically under attack. This, uh, publishes a yearly scorecard of how many attacks they noticed. And they're up in the hundreds of thousands now per year. I don't know what's in those figures. I've never really looked at them and drilled down to see what they, what they have to say. Sun Tzu also said that invincibility lies in the defense, but the possibility of victory lies in the attack. You can't be 
victorious simply by defending. First answer. So the skillful commander takes up a position in which he cannot be defeated, he misses no opportunity, and misses no opportunity to master the enemy. And I think that that, that and is an important one. These days, almost all the information system defenses we have are passive. They take up a position in which they hope they cannot be defeated, and then they do nothing else. So, um, you know, crypto systems cover traffic and then sit there and send the traffic. Uh, OS access control will say, no, you can't come in here. Try again. No, you can't come in here. No, can't. Firewall will say, no, block that session. Block that port. No access to that, to this protocol. Um, these are passive defenses. These just sit there and take it. The enemy probing these systems pays no penalty for probing. You can probe again and again and again and again. The defender is in the position of the interior. The defender sits there and takes it. The defender has to defend everywhere at all times. The attacker, on the other hand, has only got to succeed one place at one time and get into the system, especially because the system as we feel these days in the civil infrastructure and in the military infrastructure um, rely so heavily on peripheral defenses and have no internal, very few internal safeguards. They're crisp and crunchy on the outside and soft and chewy on the inside. <laughs> you get into one of these networks someplace, and these networks, I'm talking about, go across services, across the world, coalition partners. You get in someplace, and you're in every place. The internal controls in these systems are either non existent or insufficient. So the defense is on the outside, and the defender's job, a fool's errand, is to defend everywhere and at all times. And that's the way we've set up to run our defense in, in the information domain these days. So I'll give you another theorem. And this one I wish you would have by heart. This is due to Bateson. And it is that a persistent attacker eventually wins against the passive defender. Because there's no penalty for failed attacks. The attacker never dies. The attacker tries and tries and tries again. The defender may notice that he's getting attacked, but he doesn't do anything to, um, to kill the attacker. So a persistent attacker will eventually win any information security battle against the passive defender. Passive defenses are important, but they're not sufficient to win an information security battle. You've got to go out and get the guy. We need active defenses. That's a lesson I draw from, um, from science. Here. Okay, Sun Tzu also said that an army <coughs> is like water, and that it flows from high places. So a high place is not necessarily um, a volcano or a mountain. It can be any kind of any kind of strong point or a strongly defended point. The increase in the enemy's position. It may be um, <coughs> you know, uh, at the interface between two units or in a blind spot in his thinking. It's a decrease in the enemy's position, and that's where to apply 
um, the power. So water avoids strains. The army avoids strains. What are the strains in information security? The strains in information security right now are strong crypto, more strong crypto, and yet more strong crypto. Boy, can we make strong crypto. No kidding. We can make the best, strongest possible crypto, believe me. Right? We can make crypto stronger than any possible attacker. And yet, what do we do to strengthen our defenses? Build more strong crypto. Right? But the army isn't going to attack our strong crypto. It's going to strike at our weaknesses. And what are our weaknesses in the information domain? They are <laughs> operating system implementations and the fools at the keyboard. So remember, the attacker is not going to attack your crypto. The attacker is going to attack you or your operating system. And all the strong crypto in the world is not going to save you from inadequate operating systems. It makes absolutely no sense to put strong crypto as a peripheral, say, um, on Windows, or even on Windows NT, or on Solaris. I mean, I don't want to sing, single, sing, 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 I don't want to single these out just because they own the market, you know? Okay, here's a technology box score. Age, um, difficulty of developing and deploying correctly, and difficulty of attacking successfully, okay? Crypto, computer security, and the combination of them, which we've come to call the InfoSec. So crypto, of these, crypto is the, is the oldest of the technologies. And um, we know how to make it good and strong. It, it's not, it's easy. It's relatively easy. It, it's not, not for people who haven't done it, but for people who have done it, it's easy to make good, strong crypto. And it's hard to attack good, strong crypto. It's the highest form. Computer security is much newer. I mean, crypto goes back to the Old Testament. Computer security um, goes back to maybe 1960s, 1950s, 1960s. So it's relatively new. It's very hard to do correctly. Any secure operating system has endless bugs in it and hacks and people ways people know to get into it, and back doors and buffer overflows and so on. It's relatively hard to do it. And so it's been relatively easy to attack. Information security is the newest of these. It aims to combine, it aims to be an interdependence between computer security and cryptography. And it, and it, it notices that we've gone away from the channel switch model to the packet switch model, network-based operations. It aims to integrate cryptography with the uh, operating system and the operating system with cryptography. And it's probably the right thing to do but um, but it has the um, it has the effect of of making each of these columns to its worst possible state. It's hard to do infosec correctly, and it's easy to attack infosec systems. And yet, this is what we're shipping. This is what we're this is what we're sailing with. This is what we're fighting with these days. I think, uh, before I leave this, I want to say, I think we're well past the high point of computer security. We had computer systems, even as recently as 10 years ago, that were more secure than anything we have today. We had people, we had manufacturers who cared about it, um, and we had an engineering base that cared about it and knew how to build it, and we had people who were actually trying to do it. It turns out the market didn't support these systems, and so we don't see them today. Um, and now, what we have is that we have jokes for modern operating system security. The modern operating system security policies are jokes from um, a mandatory security point of view, from a military point of view. They really are. What's driving, I, I, two years ago at Oakland, or maybe last year at the IEEE Symposium, the guy from Microsoft got, no, no, Netscape got up and said his security policy was to not get in the Wall Street Journal with a bug before his competitors did. That's his security policy, to keep his head down. I mean, talk about intellectual bankruptcy. 
Are you willing to, um, to base your operational plans or your agent identities if you're an intelligence kind of person or your life or your medical records on a security policy like that? That the guy isn't going to get banged in the journal? The, the main driver, I think, unfortunately, in the commercial world these days for security policies are the needs of the content companies such as Disney. Disney wants to protect its intellectual property, and so it's, it's leaning on Microsoft and Intel to make um, systems that will effectively protect its, its intellectual property. So we're going to have to go, and oh, and then there's the Perry reform of defense acquisition, which has us using increasing POTS um, uh, for C4I systems, which I think is maybe a good thing. But it winds up meaning that we're going to go to war with Mickey Mouse security. <laughs> And like it or not, we're going to have to figure out how to, um, how, to, how, to, how to fight and win, how to achieve information dominance, no less. Information dominance is what Joint Vision uh, 2010 would have us do with Mickey Mouse security. So what to remember from this is that um, more efforts to strengthen crypto systems is just wasted at the margin. It's not where the attack is going to be. There's always a weakest link. The attacker is always going to attack the weakest link. The trick is to put the weakest link where you can see it and then to watch it. Okay. Now it's imperative to strengthen computer systems security. That's what you take away from this. While I still have time, I want to get to the third. We can go to four o'clock, right? That's what I was told. Okay. <laughs> strategies, what I hope to do is to give you enough of a flavor for it that you like, might like to um, go and pursue some of this study on your own. First, why 36? Well, 6 in this uh, yin-yang yin -yang theory, 6 is a number that represents the trickery. It also represents a water to some extent. It's interesting because Sun Tzu's analogy of water. Anyhow, and 36, of course, is 6 squared. Um, so 36 is a whole bag of trickery. And that's why that's why we have 36 um, strategies. Now I'm going to talk about the enemy. I've been talking about the enemy, and I'm going to talk about the enemy. And um, what I want to say before I push on is that we are the enemy. Um, I mean, we have an enemy, and, and we are the enemy. This quote from Pogo: "We've met the enemy, and they're us." Right? Every theory of defense contains a theory of attack. If I know what you're doing to defend yourself, I know how to attack you. Right? That's why I send spies out to draw plans of fortifications. Right? They want to see what the theory of defense is. That's why a uh, formal specification of a computer operating system security policy is a roadmap for an attacker. Right? Every theory of defense contains a theory of attack and vice versa. So even though we might talk about attack, there are lessons here for the defense. And even though we might talk about defense, there are lessons here about the attack. And this is the Xin Yang kind of stuff. This on car block. Okay, 36. Let's just make a taxonomy. This is not an ancient taxonomy, but a taxonomy that maybe only goes back a couple of hundred years. The 36 is divided up into six situations, six, and there are six strategies in each situation. So the situations are when you command superiority, strategies for confrontation, for attack, for confused situations, for gaining ground, and for desperate straits, I like that. For desperate straits. So, what I'll do is I'll show you the names of all these <laughs> strategies. We'll go through these one after the other. Um, but we're not going to talk about 30, 36 strategies in the few moments we have left. But I'll show you the names of all the strategies and we'll drill down in one or two places and talk about how it you know, relates to the information age. When commanding superiority, Let's, let me not read these out loud. You can read them to yourselves. I'll give you a moment to do that, and then we're going to drill down at number one. Okay? You don't have to copy them down. They're online. You, if you search for Sun Tzu and 36 strategies, you'll find lists of these online. So, what does he mean, cross, heaven, cross the sea without heaven's knowledge? Um, what Sansa was talking about and what he said was that familiar sites <coughs> do not arouse suspicion. 
I mean, the sea is wide open and open to surveillance. You know, they have these ocean surveillance satellites now in multiple modes. It's difficult to be stealth in all the modes um, simultaneously. So you can't cross the sea without heaven's knowledge. And heaven to Sun Tzu meant the emperor. Heaven was the emperor, and the emperor had spies everywhere. Okay? So cross the sea without um, heaven's knowledge. He suggests that we have an overt purpose for every hidden purpose that we have. Given that we're going to be spotted, right? let's have a cover story. Let's make it look as though we're doing business as usual. Um, for example, if I wanted to um, plant the Trojan horse, <coughs> give you a Trojan horse, I'd say, hi, I'm from Red Star Software, and I have this, um, and I, well, it used to be the Cold War. Yeah. Hi, I'm from Red Star Software, and I have this version of Excel, which um, is better than Microsoft Excel, totally compatible, does all these other things, and by the way, it's free. Okay. So I lulled you into putting my Trojan horse in your thing. Um, what we do in the information domain should look like business as usual to people who are watching us, if we have a covert purpose. I'm going to skip a bunch and look at number two. <laughs> Here are the strategies number two. Strategies for confrontation. Let's just drill at. Let's just drill at this one. Number ten. Hide a dagger and a smile. Um, the idea is to reassure the enemy and make it slacken its vigilance. The idea is to make contact with the enemy early, maybe before he even knows that you're in contact. So you masquerade as somebody who might be an insider with the enemy. For instance, a booster, this is a commercial domain of risk. A booster, a shareholder, a friend, a job applicant, go and get an email account behind the enemy's firewall. Um, become his vendor, become his customer. Send the special operators to go see him. Right? And then you do a lot of reconnaissance on the enemy like this, and then, um, then you come back and plan your attack. You plan your attack, and you practice your attack, and you don't practice your attack on your enemy, says Sun Tzu, you practice your attack and then you go and execute your attack on your enemy. So you need to have systems that look like the enemy's systems on which you can practice your attack. Here's number three. Let's just look at this one. Lure the tiger out of the mountain. Uh, if the enemy's up in his stronghold, the tiger's up in his stronghold, we don't want to go to attack him there. We want to get him when he travels. We want to get if we can't get you know if we can't get his mainframe we can get his travelers laptops when he's out. Um, more than one airline has put audio bugs in the first class and business class seats of his national carrier to overhear conversations when the enemy without of his headquarters is traveling. Encourage the enemy to visit your website. Number four. And I want to particularly talk about this number 20, which says take advantage of his internal struggles. Many people think that an objective of, of information operations is to take down the enemy's network. I would suggest a, a, a more subtle objective would be to become a node in the enemy's network and to participate in the enemy's network um, way before he knows you're after him. In fact, not just any node, but ideally you become his network control center. Um, I think it can be done and it would lead to great things <laughs> for you, but not for the enemy. Here's number six, strategies for gaining ground. Replace the beam and pillars with rod and timber. Ah, that's becoming the enemy's network control center without his knowledge. And then when he leans on his infrastructure, when you're, when you're massing effects on him in other domains, when you're massing fires on him, on political or diplomatic things on him, or forces on him, and he leans heavily on his infrastructure, you just let his infrastructure sag so it doesn't support his weight anymore. Or you modify his databases so that his view of the world is consistent with one that you would like, it, like him um, to have. It's not just the enemy, his commanders that you can do this with, it's his, it's his um, citizens, his media. This is the whole area of psyops, uh, psychological warfare, which to my mind is part, a fair part of information warfare. Was I up to number six? Did I show you number five? 
that was yeah. five. We start five. That was five? Yeah. Okay. Number six, strategies for desperate straits. <coughs> Let's look at number 36. <laughs> right. Chairman Mao, a wonderful guerrilla warfare warfighter, said if the battle can be won, fight it. If not, run away. No reason to fight a battle that you can't win. Just depart. Prepare your, you prepare your escape routes in advance. You can position your backup network access. If you have valuable information, you don't put it on the internet. And you keep it in an isolated system. That's the same keeping in the shoebox. Right? This, is the inf this is the information that runs away from the internet. Right? Um, you choose your own time, your own place, your own weapon uh, to fight. You don't do it on the enemy's terms. And I'm going to take advice now and run away. Because only because time is up. But the bottom line of all this stuff is that um, it's a lot of fun to look through these old books and read these old aphorisms that are so telescopic they can mean almost anything. I mean, they really kind of boil down. I mean, what does it mean, um, leave at large the better to capture? Or the, chica the cicada sloughs its skin. What does it mean? Right? And then to read what other people have said about it, and what Sun Tzu said about it, and to think about it yourself. To think about what does it mean, how does it inform your current situation? How does it inform what you're up to? In particular, how does it inform stuff in this information um, domain? I think you can study it to your advantage. I think you ignore it to your peril um, because other people are studying it. Uh, this stuff, uh, well, not Sun Tzu in the information in cyberspace, but Sun Tzu, as you know, is taught in military staff colleges worldwide. I'm sorry our time was so short today. If you would like to engage with me on this and talk about some of this stuff deeper, here's an email address. Thank you. Netscape's attitude reflects that uh, of the industry as a whole. They're not really that concerned about this happening to us. Well, the Microsoft guy, the Microsoft gal who was sitting next to Netscape one said, yeah, me too. <laughs> now, they may not be authorized spokesmen for their companies on this, um, on this particular subject, so they may not have been <laughs> saying the official company line, but yet these were both senior executives with their companies. Caught in an unguarded moment, I So I think, uh, do you agree that this, uh, we become, particularly as consumers become more information dependent and start to get burned and start to lose those kind of features that the industry will respond with better, better security? It's possible. Yeah, it's certainly possible. Um, that, uh, I mean, I think the computer industry is a marvelous industry in response to market demands. And I think when people demand it, 
that industry will begin um, to deliver it. In the meantime, I see we're dependent more and more on um, consumer-grade uh, computational resource, consumer-grade defenses for the conduct of um, military activities. And so I think we're going into a period of extraordinary vulnerability. Next. What do you think it's going to take before the industry as a whole gets the picture that we need to improve security in our operating systems? Some say it's got to be this electronic electronic Pearl Harbor. Is it going to really take that much, or is it just going to take the media catching all the stories? Well, the, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, electronic Pearl Harbor, electronic Three Mile Island. Um, which is a little different than Pearl Harbor. Um, it's difficult. I, I don't know what's going to make it happen. I've been waiting. I've been working in this area for 30 years, and I haven't seen it happen yet. I always think it's going to happen, you know, two days from now. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. The trouble with security, with defensive security, is it is very hard to sell. But American managers are taught to make cost-benefit analysis. They look at to see what things cost, and then they look to see, you know, quantify what the benefit is going to be, dollar benefit, and they compare the two. And they see how long does some investment take to pay back. And the trouble with defensive security technologies, you can always see what they cost, but you can never see in, in dollars what it is they gain you. And so it's very difficult for a manager in the United States to buy them because you can't make the cost benefit analysis. Isn't it? Somewhat contingent on the fact that the, uh, the manufacturing market has been so dynamic and the perishable state of the products that they're making seems to just just be overcome by the dynamics of the new products they manufacture at such a rapid rate that you could, you could possibly never get a return on that investment. Yeah, that's true. I mean, for sure, you know, if you look at a computer today, if you buy a computer today, you know that you can buy one a year from now or 18 months from now, it's going to be twice as powerful or half the size or both. But yet, that might also allow a rapid introduction of security once um, some sort of crisis event, such as we uh, proposed here, like an electronic Pearl Harbor, might happen. I think the rollout of effective security could be very fast um, once the uh, political and commercial will is there to do it. But that's not there now. There was a time when the US government thought that it could drive the security market and tried to organize something called the Computer Security Initiative. And it said to the manufacturers, you build a stuff like this, and it was an orange book. Um, you build this stuff like this, we'll evaluate it, and we'll buy it. Well, some manufacturers did, some were evaluated, the government hardly bought any. The manufacturers, um, they worse than lost interest, they got really PO'd. And they went away, and they're not going to play that game anymore anytime soon, so, you know, I mean, so long as they um, remember. Plus which, in the meantime, the military, which used to be a major buyer, major customer for computers in the aggregate in the U.S., has become a minuscule customer, not can't move the market. The military, the US military, the US government cannot move the computer market anymore. How far do you think public key authentication is going to go to solve a lot of our woes? 80%, 50%, 0%? Well, public key authentic okay, authentication. Widespread authentication. Why, okay, so suppose there's universal, suppose there's a universal PKI. Right. Um, and it works. Um, and it's. Uh, I mean, authentication just tells you who's there. You've still got to make access control decisions. Right? So, so you have better information about who's there. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't improve the access control mechanisms of the operating systems at all. Isn't that the first step for now for defense, though, is knowing who the heck's, who the heck's trying to ping you? Possibly. If you don't know who it is, you have to hit everybody. Right. If you, don't, if you don't know who it is, you have to hit everybody. <laughs> right? Whereas Hal says, if you know who it is, getting uh, everything. But I point out to you that the public key infrastructure is being fielded on quicksand. The private keys, which, which are used to sign the certificates in the public key infrastructures, are being stored in NT computers. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you, can't, you cannot build a secure system on quicksand. You know. <coughs> yes? Sir, in relation to your comment that the, uh, that the old 
hold such a small market share. How does it, is the corporate world satisfied in regards to corporate espionage with the secure systems that they have now, or are they dissatisfied and possibly push the market more secure systems? I don't hear a lot of um, dissatisfaction. I think there's a lot more corporate espionage goes on than corporations realize. And maybe that that's going to be a piece of the uh, information age Pearl Harbor um, that we hear about. Sorry. You mentioned the uh, Orange Book. What is yeah. the latest with NSA, the Rainbow series, and C2 by 92? Is that all gone away, or is that the... Well, 92 has gone away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know the current state of uh, regulation. You're sort of sublimating. It's, it's formless. I think the, uh, so far as I see, they've lost the will for C2 by 92. Some of us thought it should have been B2 by 92, by the way. I mean, C2 by 92 is a great slogan. Um, but it doesn't buy you much security. You know, people only, I think actually what will make people serious about information defenses are when they begin to practice information offenses. Most commanders are, are pretty blasé about, about ComSec until they start seeing some signals. And then they say, you know, we copied him saying what? You know, what about my communications um, as well? So uh, until we start um, seeing take from information operations, we're not going to get serious about defenses. Yeah. You mentioned the IT21 initiative and mentioned the developer group of billion dollars. Is that a There's a small portion um, that talks about security, but there's no detail. Mm -hmm. but, no, no detail in the article I saw. I just read it in Federal Computer Week. Okay. comes from an article in Federal Computer I'm sure there's a security portion. Almost any program these days has a line in it that says, oh, yes, and we'll do security. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, the, it's, it, it's not the, I mean, it's not the obvious operational requirement for a system. I mean, it's, it's, it's less obvious requirement than interoperability or than performance. Suppose you're doing theater air missile defense. I mean, you know, there are timing requirements and waveform requirements and turnaround requirements and priority and interoperability and what. And, and oh, yes, it has to be secure, I suppose. But it's, it's an, usually an afterthought. Well, we better wrap up the case anyway. So that's 5 o'clock class. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Burson again for coming. You can come down and uh, chat with us a little bit now. And uh, you people up in the top must be boiling. So uh, we'll let you, let you go now. And thank you very much for your time.